In my talk, I want to talk about successful programs, programs that actually work, and I'm going to give you an idea of the range of those programs, and all of those, of course, suggest things that we can do in public policy. So legislative bodies have a very important role to play. I spent a lot of time thinking about this, and I want to emphasize in everything that I say the role of evidence, and by that I mean a particular kind of evidence, I'll come back to that. But what Congress did, and I would say at least 50 pieces of legislation, is that they changed our low-income programs so that people who worked and had income could benefit from the programs. In the old days, many of our programs, people who worked were automatically off the rolls. Medicaid was like that. In Medicaid, you could only get Medicaid, including children, if you were either on the Supplemental Security Income Program or on the Aid to Families or Dependent Children Program. Once you left those programs, the kids, and the adults and the kids lost Medicaid. Well, what kind of work incentive is that? You're still much better off when you start losing benefits than you were in the old days. But here's the key. The system won't work unless people work. People have to have a job, even if it's a hamburger flipping, flipping job and they're making nine bucks an hour. That's what keys the whole system in. So a very serious flaw in the system is, during a time like we're in now, when so many low-income people lose work, they get a double whammy. They not only lose their earnings, they lose their earned income tax credit, they lose the child tax credit, because all of these are key down earnings. So this is a particularly difficult time for low-income families. Uh, and that, again, is why we have to do a lot more about employment. So I want to talk about four approaches to evidence-based policy. This is a part of my uh, talk that's addressed especially to legislators, but I think everybody, I hope you're interested in this as well. Uh, the first thing is, uh, evidence-based reviews of social science evidence. This is getting to be a real art. We now have organizations like the Campbell Coalition that their main goal in life is to review bodies of research using only the good studies that produce reliable results and see what we know average across these studies. Now this is a purely common sense thing. If we spend a lot of money for research, and research is going on not just in the U.S. but all over the world, and we're learning important things about human development, or in my interest, and in what we'll talk about most here, is programs uh, that are intervention programs that try to change something in the real world, make the kid smarter, make them more ready for school, uh, help an English language learner, learn to speak English better, and so forth. We want to know if we know things that work. The second thing is evidence-based grant making, and this is where we really had some action in the last four or five years. I don't think many states are focused on this, maybe Washington State somewhat, but here's the basic idea. If we actually do know something from these reviews and from the high-quality random assignment studies, I'll talk about that in just a minute, then if we start new programs and make new investments, then we should use these model programs. It makes sense that we would use model programs. So, the first part of evidence-based grant making is that in the text of the legislation, but even more importantly in the text of the funding announcements that go out for people who are going to apply for the money, that they need to, they need to say that they're going to use approaches that have evidence that they actually work. So the second point of this is that legislation should also be written so that it is guaranteed to produce new evidence. So they have to be very strong reporting requirements uh, we, we have much better measures for many things that we do now. The measures of education are really quite good. So we can find out if we're actually having an impact by collecting these measures. So there need to be reporting requirements and there need to be new experiments, new random assignment experiments. Let me just say a few things about what works clearing houses because I think they're really so vital to let all of us know and legislators know in an efficient way and in a way where there's quality control about what really works. So it's a trusted website with information about social programs that have impacts. It provides an overview of research, and it gives details on individual studies, and often gives lots of details about the specific interventions and how, you know, what their characteristics are and how they should be implemented. They can only include studies that really do meet a high evidentiary standard. This is a crucial part of this whole enterprise because every program operator will tell you their program works. If evaluation shows it doesn't work, there's something wrong with evaluation, not the program. And that's the mindset we need to change. We need to become confident that when we read that a program works and legislators are facing funding decisions, that they are actually dealing with information that will tell them whether programs work or not. 
If we did all these things as a matter of course and became part of the culture of evidence and evaluation and program change in the United States, many, many, many areas of social problems would get great improvements over time. I'm not putting any of that aside, but I'm focusing on how confident we are that if we implement a program and do it right, that we know it will produce results. These are evidence-based initiatives developed by the Obama administration. Uh, I have received uh, money from the Grant Foundation to study the implementation of these initiatives. Um, we've done about, about 100 interviews of people in the Congress and interest groups uh, and scholars and people in the administration. And we're learning a lot about how legislative bodies can write statutes that require evidence. So both parts of the agenda that I showed you before. A, that programs that get the money have to have evidence that they're going to work. And B, that the, in implementing the programs, there are new evidence is generated and the evidence is used to try to perfect the programs and improve the programs, something that many people call continuous improvement. You don't want to spend 100% on proven programs unless you happen to believe that we've already discovered every program that could possibly work. You have to leave some money for innovation. Innovation is a crucial part. Some people believe so much in innovation they don't want to know anything about data. They just want to innovate, great new stuff. So we've got to figure out a way to have this balance. And all of these initiatives were written with the understanding that we did need to leave some of the money, sometimes it's 25% of the money, that is left for either promising approaches or things that actually have some evidence but not really compelling evidence like the top tier of evidence does. So innovation is built into all these initiatives. You always have to have innovation. And by definition, when you innovate, you don't know if it's going to work. If you did, it's not innovation. Now, agency portfolios. So we need organizations like OMB, every state should have one, that imposes its will on the other organizations that under like the Department of Health and Human Services, Department of Justice and so forth. They all all of them should change to have a culture something like uh, evidence based. And you can see all of the approaches that could be taken by these organizations. I'm not going to go through each of these, but uh, this slideshow will be available so if you want to inspect any of these. These are the kind of things that an office, a state level office that's trying to change the culture and make more of the programs funded by the state and often the federal dollars and the state dollars to make them more effective. Now I want to talk about four specific examples of areas where I think we actually know something, where we have evidence that if we did programs like this and we did them well and we did them with a high percentage, especially of low-income children and low-income people, that they would be better off, our economy would be better off, and the whole society would be better off. And let me start with preschool. This is an area where we really have very strong evidence, beginning with its adversary, we have more recent evidence that if we had high-quality preschool, kids would start school much more ready for school and they would do better in school. In fact, if we're successful here, we should see national scores in reading and math begin to change. And I think we, it's possible, we can't link this up with high quality data, but our scores, especially for black kids, have already begun to change. And the gap between black children and white children has actually narrowed over the years. Secondly, manufacturing extension partnership. Uh, the Department of Commerce has been running this program, I think, now. It's over 30 years. And the idea is that in the United States, of fairly substantial percentage of our workers are in small to medium sized businesses, usually defined as 500 or fewer, but often, you know, 20, 30, 40. And they are not necessarily in the mainstream. They don't necessarily keep up with technology. They don't keep up with the training uh, programs and so forth. So the purpose of these uh, extension partnerships is to help them and bring this techni technical information to them. There are something like uh, almost 2,000 uh, people who are part of this and who will, in many cases, provide free. It's paid for by the federal government, sometimes by the state, sometimes by foundations. And so the whole idea is to help small businesses become more effective and more efficient and grow, and then they can hire more people. And now we're back to the original agenda that I talked about, where we want these kind of jobs so that people can go to community colleges and get the skills they need and do well in these jobs. So this manufacturing and sense of partnership has actually been shown in quite sophisticated experiments to have a major impact, not only on the businesses, but on their productivity 
and on their profitability. And if we had more of this, they could expand. There, incidentally, there's an office right here in Raleigh, and they have extensions throughout North Carolina. I would say that the manufacturing extension partnerships are actually having an impact in North Carolina. If I were chair of the committee in the legislature, I'd look into this very carefully and find out how I could help these organizations do even better. We need the ability to take low-income people, many of them school dropouts, many of them you know, maybe worked at uh, in, a, in a job that doesn't require great, great skills, and to bring them into short-term training programs. First, short-term. Second, that train them for jobs available in the local economy so that if they graduate and finish and get the skills, they'll get a job, and they can see that their friends and relatives who were in the program before actually got a job and this begins to build up and do say we want to get into this program. And third, this is where the role of community colleges come in. They could offer these programs. So a great organization called uh, Public Private Ventures did a large scale focus in three places experiment, random assignment to whole works, everything I described before, about whether if you had programs that did this, could you actually produce an impact? And boy did they have it. So here is the sectoral employment uh, hours work in the shaded areas, the difference between the experimental group on the top and the control group on the bottom. It's interesting that during the time that they were training, of course, the control group made more money. But then once the training ended and the people began to move into these better jobs, look at what happened. So they, uh, they worked more and, naturally, they made more money as well. Finally, career academies, there are many of these in the United States, they've been around for a long time. The, the intervention has three parts. They make the school smaller, sometimes they actually build walls in the school so they get maybe 200 students together so they're not in an enormous 2,000 word school. And they have curriculum that focuses on both, um, in, what, in old days we call industrial arts, but actual skills that are needed in the local economy. And then the academic side as well, so they learn their English and math and science and so forth. And then a crucial part of the introduction of this program is that they give them experiences in the actual economy. So they have mentors, they visit businesses, sometimes they job shadow, that's probably the best thing that they spend, say, a month, and they go in two or three days a week and actually see what happens uh, when they, if they get a job in, in a company and what's expected about being on time and taking supervision and all that. And again, these impacts are just spectacular. And this is based on random assignment, eight different sites, eight year follow-up. This is eight years after the program ended. And no impacts for girls, by the way, we talked about that, it's fascinating. But big impacts for the boys. And they made an average over the eight years of $30,000 more. These are serious impacts. And get this, they were more likely to be married and they were more likely to live with the mother of their children. Some of them were not married yet, but they lived in a household with their children. That in itself is a huge outcome. That could have rever reverberating effects throughout our economy and especially on those kids. So this, this program is really to die for. So what I am talking about here is cultural change. Legislative bodies play a crucial role in it. Program operators play a crucial role in it. Uh, and university play a crucial role because they are the source of much of the research that we need. But we need a virtuous cycle of better random assignment research on the effects of our programs, making this information available to the public, funding only programs that have good evidence, and using some of the money to generate new programs and find out if they work, and continuous evaluations of the program we have. If we did this, and it swept the country 20 years or 10 years from now, we would be having much bigger impacts. We would begin to solve our problem with poverty, and we would begin to solve our problems with opportunity in the United States.